who are deployed sensibly and coherently to really make development work. So how can this happen? How can you help your country? Only, I believe, if you are fully informed, fully aware, and fully on board. In 1947, Secretary of State Marshall said this about post-war Europe to his Harvard graduates. He said, I need not tell you that the world situation is very serious. That must be apparent to all intelligent people. But, he said, I think one difficulty is that the problem is of such enormous complexity that the very mass of facts presented to the public by the press and radio make it exceedingly difficult for the man in the street to reach a clear appraisement of the situation. And furthermore, he went on, the people of this country are distant from the troubled areas of the earth and, from, and it's hard for them to comprehend. That is precisely the same today. Rebuilding Europe and Japan after World War II resulted in peaceful, stable democracies that for long periods were also economic powerhouses that never threatened Europe or the United States again. But in order for your government today to adequately address Afghanistan and Haiti and Iraq and all the places that I've mentioned, to even have a shot at success, I've come to believe deeply in the strategic necessity of the people's right to know and their duty to be informed. And that's where journalism comes in, my profession, and I really hope the profession that many graduates will choose. Because I strongly believe that this can be a great and noble endeavor. It is a public trust if and when it serves the public interest. I am a true believer in the power of this profession to be a force for good. Where would the world be without a press that's uncovered injustice, corruption, inhumanity, or a press that's on the cutting edge of reform, of civil rights, of desegregation, and of all the smaller but vital issues that affect us every single day and that affect all our daily lives? A press which pursues the truth, often on pain of death. And today, ladies and gentlemen, it is regrettable but painful death is the leading cause of the demise of journalists around the world. Murder, deliberate attempts to shut down the message and to silence the messengers. And those murders are the least investigated and those murderers act with impunity. There is virtually no accountability. And yet, around the developing world where this phenomenon is so dangerous, it is journalists and press who are on the cutting edge of reform, who champion change, who spur on democracy, and who defend people's rights. So I believe that, as Jefferson said, a strong and robust democracy, even this one, needs a fully informed citizenry. It needs independent journalists of integrity and vigor who are not cripplingly cynical, who are committed to reporting the facts without fear nor favor, who insist on asking the rigorous questions, and who insist on holding power accountable, who never fear dissent, but at the same time are never bludgeoned into confusing dissent with disloyalty, who believe also that having this platform and this voice, this access, comes with enormous and profound responsibility. We in television have a patron saint. His name is Edward R. Morrow. And in 1958, the year I was born, he said this about what was then a new fangled invention called television. He said that this instrument can teach, it can illuminate, and yes, it can even inspire, but it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends. Otherwise, it is merely wires and lights in a box. But he went on to say that there is a great and perhaps decisive battle to be fought against ignorance intolerance and indifference. And this weapon of television could be useful. And I believe that there is nothing more useful than television done well, and nothing more powerful. I believe also that contrary to what many of our thought leaders tell us, Americans are and do care about the world and their place in it. Remember the amazing statistic leading up to the election of 2008 when the vast majority of Americans said that a key desire for their next president was for him to restore America's place and prestige in this world. 
So it's for all of those reasons that, like you today, I also am holding my breath and jumping into the unknown. Because after 27 years of loving and leaving, living and breathing CNN, I'm taping up an incredible new opportunity and also a challenge to host this week the distinguished Sunday morning news and political affairs program on ABC News. Because I will have, I hope, one extraordinary opportunity and chance to reach a larger American audience and to try simply to add to the conversation, to explore substantive issues that affect people beyond just pure politics. And also to bring a perspective on the world that I've been able to accumulate from living and working abroad and traveling around to tell people's stories. I believe so deeply in the promise and the ability of America and Americans that it does often frustrate me to see the limited discussion in so many of our public spaces and public press of the substantive issues and, moreover, to see only such a slim sliver of the world that ever breaks through onto the airwaves here in this country. And yet, as I travel all over the world, people everywhere, from the slums of the poorest, poorest hovels to the salons of the richest places, they know everything about you, everything about your country. More than 30 years ago, when revolution rumbled across my country, Iran, when my father sadly told me it's all over and that nothing would be the same again, I was afraid. I was 20 years old and this was my political awakening. And the Islamic revolution that shook Iran was the world's first and it did not only shake Iran, it shook America and it shook the rest of the world and it still is. But that forced me to suddenly become an adult in a turbulent world after a calm and privileged childhood growing up in the Shah's Iran where we didn't do politics. I remember the violence in the streets, the martial law, the soldiers with the fixed bayonets in our face if we broke the curfew and the protest filled streets. I remember evenings sitting with my parents and my sisters on our porch and we could hear the sounds from the mosque as Ayatollah Khomeini's deep voice secretly smuggled in on audio tapes. There was no internet, no blog, no Twitter, no Facebook, no global television. This was before CNN. On audio tapes into the mosque, rumbling low and determined over our neighborhood and everywhere. And overnight, the revolution turned us into strangers into our own land. We lost our home, we lost our possessions, we lost family and friends, people were jailed, People were tortured, people, including members of my family,